A Roman gentleman is working at his desk in a handsome villa somewhere in Ravenna. The year is shortly before 500 AD, and his name is Boethius. He's still a young man, and he's conceived a very ambitious plan, which is nothing less than to translate the riches of Greek learning into Latin. And at the moment we find him, looking over his shoulder, if you like, he's just turned his attention to music. Now, as he writes, he takes the very patrician view of musical art that came easily enough to a member of an ancient and illustrious Roman clan like him. The study of music, he writes, as a rational pursuit is much nobler than mere composition or performance. Well, Boethius believed, as many Romans of his time believed, that those who sing and play instruments have no knowledge of the intellectual basis of music, what we'd call music theory, for in every sense of the expression, it is all Greek to them. They're therefore in a servile position, he says, and that's not just a figure of speech, of course. Many of the instrumentalists and singers whom Boethius would have known in 6th century Italy, that is Ostrogothic Italy, there is a Goth on the throne of Italy now, were indeed slaves, of course, in the juridical sense. Ranking no higher than domestic chattels, they were the household goods of the persons who owned them. Now, in that scheme of things, as you can imagine, there really is not much scope for the notion of an accomplished performer who also understands the theory of music and is deemed to have an important, indeed, a vital task to perform. In the world of Boethius, only those belonging to a patrician class receive the education necessary to understand the theory of music, and they, by long tradition, were contemptuous of the public display that performance requires. That is not something a Roman gentleman, or indeed a Roman lady, will do. So ultimately, to press Boethius's point really to its limit, the true musician is actually not concerned with audible sound at all. He believes, perhaps with John Keats, that heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Well, it seems to me that in various ways, this is all fundamentally unchristian. After all, the dignity, even, do you think, the necessity of music as a practice has long been accepted in Christian tradition and indeed, you could say, associated with its fondest hope. I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Revelation 14.2. Not only did the early Christians gather to sing when they worshipped, they accepted that psalmody was spiritually profitable because of its sweetness and not in spite of it. A psalm, and I quote, penetrates the heart when it gives pleasure is easily remembered when it is sung, and what the sternness of the law cannot dispel from human minds, the part psalms expel through the sweetness of music. So says one early commentator. It was widely recognized that the outstanding value and the great danger of music was that it could move the mind and the spirit more deeply than purely verbal persuasion. As I said in my last series of lectures, it was more powerful than the word. And the word was with God, if you remember, at the beginning of John's gospel. Now, this was especially true, the power of music, when worshippers joined in a psalmodizing brotherhood or community, a psalins fraternitas, the surrender of the individual voice to the common chorus testified to the unity of the church in an especially potent way. But, and this is a big but, the immense riches of medieval plain song, as notably, for example, the Gregorian chant, 
which we've all heard in some form or another and will soon be hearing today. It didn't come into existence because the churches favored community singing. No, it didn't. That is not how the foundations of our Western musical tradition were laid. They were gradually, those foundations, set in place as the laity, as you and I, were increasingly told to keep silent, to make way for the solo and choral performances of those who were, in a sense, a very loose sense, the professionals. In other words, one of the defining things that made the rise of the Christian singer possible is the decline of the lay participant, the eclipse of you and me. Well, let's be clear about one thing right from the off. A singer in the church of the early Middle Ages, however necessary or admired his art might be, was generally appointed in much the same way as a grave digger or a janitor, a doorkeeper. All of those offices, singer, grave digger, janitor, were considered too lowly for any new appointment to require the presence of the bishop. A priest was enough. So whereas the task of ordaining a reader required the bishop to hear reports of the candidate's reputation for honest living, and then to present him with a book in a public ceremony, a singer, who of course was often charged to voice the same texts but in song, could be admitted virtually without taking up references or undergoing any codified right of admission. So let's ponder for a moment what may have been happening among singers in the churches of the early Middle Ages, those long centuries which it seems to me we may well call the Dark Age. I really have no problem with the term, unlike some of my professional colleagues, a Dark Age in the sense that much about them is shadowed and obscure. One sense, of course, of the word dark. To bring the work of these long, silent singers into focus, there hardly anything remains of them, of course, except a stone detritus of broken inscriptions and a few references in text, some of which those of you who were here for the last lecture would have seen. To bring them into focus, I think we need to consider and distinguish two kinds of performance. Let me offer you this. Now, in the first way of performing, the singer, crudely speaking, invents what he or she is singing to the given text. The text is stable, but they are free, you might say, to improvise, compounding musical elements they've learned in an apprenticeship. But in the second kind of performance, the singer repeats a fixed melody that he or she has learned because it was deemed important for music and text together to be the same as they were last time, the same as the time before that, and so back into the mists of a tradition that worshippers of all faiths, in my experience, commonly and sometimes perhaps uncritically invoke in relation to their practice and what they do. Now, I would suspect that you would want to argue that these two kinds of performance that I've described, crudely speaking, improvising and memorizing, can't be too sharply distinguished, and you'd be absolutely right, I think. Those of you who admire any kind of jazz will know improvisation is often a very complex process, and it very often involves various kinds of memorized elements, doesn't it, that may be the same or very nearly so each time the musician mobilizes them. But I think the distinction holds good, and what I would like to suggest to you is that the history of Christian singing in these dark ages between the New Testament and the Gothic cathedrals is in large measure a slow journey from improvising to composing and memorizing, a slow process of fixing, a slow process of wanting it to be the same this time as it was last time, 
and the time before that, and the ritual meaning of the thing in here is in it being stable like that. Not it's just done in the right sort of way, not that it sounds sort of right, but that it's the right thing, appointed for that day at that time. Well, it's time for some music, and I'm giving Catherine a break for a moment because I want to hear you something on, on record. It's time we heard what all this, in a way, is leading to, the repertoire of developed Gregorian chant. And I'd like you to hear a choral Alleluia, Pascha Nostrum, which is, an, of course, is an Easter chant. And here you'll, you'll spot the differentiation between the choral sections and the solo sections, which are sung by uh, Stephen Harold and Charles Daniels, which go higher and are more virtuosic. I mean, this is not really self-effacing music. There is a desire on the part of the maker of the chant and the singer of it to step forward into the limelight at certain points, as I think you'll see. Now let's think about the words. I've been talking about singing, but the actual texts. Now here, I think, is another way in which, to put it this way again, you and I cease to be important as church singers during the first thousand years of Christian history. Now we all know that the Latin tongue, the language of worship in the Western churches, was transformed in the mouths of slaves traders and farmers to become what are now called French, Italian, 
Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian, Catalan, Sardinian, and so on, the other Romance languages. But the Latin used by singers in the services of the church continued to be spelled and pronounced in a conservative way because liturgical languages always are conservative. That's why some of us are still saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, using a form of speech that has not been current in English for a very long time. But outside the churches, the common Latin speech evolved into those Romance tongues. Words were transformed in the mouth, very often shortened all over the old lands of the Western Empire. That's why, for example, a Latin word like viridiarium, meaning a pleasure garden, evolved in the mouths of farmers, slaves, and traders into French verger, an orchard. Six syllables become two. The silencing of the congregational voice in chanting, this is something I profoundly believe, and the rise of the specialist singer were connected with the deepening differences between a fossilized Latin used in worship and Latin as it was actually spoken on its journey to become French, Italian, Spanish, and all the others. And the archaic version, the sung version, was increasingly unintelligible to those who weren't trained in it. The difference between the two varieties, in other words, was not just linguistic, but social. The monks, nuns, and clergy forming literate groups were, for the most part, the only ones trained to wield the archaic variety for worship. It's almost as if, this is a rather, I can see that this is a rather, um, possibly a difficult point to grasp, but it's rather as if, instead of speaking to you now in an evolved form of Anglo-Saxon, which is what I'm doing, the tongue, the speech I'm using now is English, but it has evolved a long way from English, as it were, say, in the year 1000. But if I were to address you in an unevolved form of our common tongue, you might have some difficulty understanding me. Leo van men, you can have that sort of this world is on Oster, and it near lack them end. That may have communicated my point, or may not. Some of you may, <laughs> some of you may be fluent in Anglo-Saxon. I can't really say. I've just said to you, beloved people, know what the truth is. This world is in haste, and it rushes on towards the end. But that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. The liturgical sung version remains unevolved, and the version in the streets the version of you and me, evolves. Well, who were the key people in all this? Well, I think we should be looking to the bishops. Now, I don't know what you think about this, but it seems to me that today, most bishops, save perhaps the Bishop of Rome, which of course is the job description for the Pope, have become perhaps rather distant figures in the lives of many of us. Sometimes perhaps their interventions into current political or moral debate seem uh, sometimes ill-judged or even un unwelcome, sometimes. So it's difficult to think ourselves back into the minds of those for whom the bishops were public officials of a crucial kind. A late antique bishop could be an emissary for his city and its ambassador, especially when, for example, a parley might uh, uh, prevent imminent danger. Pope Leo's journey to negotiate with Attila and his horde of Hunnic archers in the year 452 is only one example, albeit the most famous. It was the Pope that went to Pali with Attila in his tent. And of course, the prayers and penitential processions that a bishop led were the principal public response to such emergencies as a famine or an outbreak of disease. And to a new barbarian king, a Goth perhaps, or a Frank, or a Vandal, who might have no Latin, say perhaps what he picked up in the barracks, if there were any still speaking it there, the bishop was a valuable source of expertise in the Latin language and in Roman law. Well, a bishop's church, of course, is a cathedral. Now, many Western cities had acquired a cathedral by about 500, but the evidence for these buildings is often really very fragmentary and uncertain. It's often buried if anything remains at all beneath later structures, all the details have to be recovered from texts that are extremely late. 
But we do at least know, archaeologists can tell us this, that many cathedrals were built within the walls of the old Roman cities, but usually very close to those walls, because as you can imagine, the cathedral was often the last great public building added to the cityscape before the early Middle Ages takes over, of course, and the Roman Empire in the West is no more, and no one is building in stone on that sort of scale. So very often the cathedral is the last thing to be slotted in. So you often find it right by the walls. Sometimes, as bishop's power increased, the church would be moved. That happened at Arles. Originally, the church of saint Trophime in Arles, in south of France, was right by the walls. But as episcopal power increased, they moved it to the old forum area, obviously a, 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 for a long time a focus uh, of, of the city. Indeed, the cathedral and the buildings that went with it, in, a, in like a cluster, were often the only public structures by, let's say, 500 AD that were still being maintained. You know, a great building, if you don't constantly look after it, will eventually fall down but the cathedrals were being maintained. The rest were being left to decay or were being plundered for building material, columns, capitals, blocks of dressed stone. These Roman buildings were being cannibalized to build fresh ones of a much lower standard. What's more, archaeologists can tell us that cathedrals were often liable to be expanded and developed at a time when the older public buildings, such as the amphitheaters, for example, were gradually receiving an infill of poor quality houses and shops, their original uses abandoned. At Geneva, excavations have yielded especially clear results, and the cathedral acquired an, uh, an impressive audience hall in the fifth century, supplied with a heating system and floor mosaics. Other sites reveal reception chambers, dining rooms, kitchens, baptisteries, residence for senior clergy, and of course, quarters for the bishop's wife. The clerical celibacy was not yet the law in the West, together with a lodging house for guests or paupers, what in medieval use would be called a hospital. And it's in places like those you won't be surprised to hear. As, as this sub-Roman landscape begins to deteriorate within the walls of the old cities and the cathedral arrives and is maintained, it's in places like this that some form of collegiate organization for singers can be traced as early as 500 AD. And often in old Roman cities around the Mediterranean that are close to the sea or a riverine route. I mean, what is the Roman Empire? Just look at it on a map. It's hugging the Mediterranean. It's hugging the littoral. It's a sea-based empire in many respects. Consider, for example, Marseille, which was still in the early Middle Ages a functioning gateway to the Mediterranean for those who lived at the north. Bulk goods such as olive oil and wine were brought up here, together with more luxurious things that included the many kinds of spices, cumin, sought by the Frankish kings in the north at Metz, Reims, or Trier on the glass grasslands. The earliest appearance in the west that I know of, of a specialized name for a liturgical singer, Cantor, can be traced in the Diocese of Marseille around the year 475. And for other examples, we need to keep close to the sea. I think for the first five centuries of Christian history, it has a salty sea tang air to it. A cantor named Marinus, appropriately enough, he who is connected with the sea, the name presumably means, bore the quasi-military or bureaucratic title Primiserius Cantorum, leader of the singers at Naples, just after 500. And he's perhaps the first head of a scola cantorum, or collegiate body of singers on record. A generation later, four cantors from Ravenna could be found going to Rome on the business of their cathedral. Here are their names. Honorius, Tranquillus, Antonius, Menitus. How thoroughly Roman they sound. There's not a trace of a Germanic barbarian name there. Nothing Gothic like Cinderic. Nothing Frankish like Theodobert. These men think of themselves as Romans. In 535 AD, we find another cantor commemorated in a mosaic pavement at Trent. His name was Laurentius, another solidly Roman name. And he was a man of some wealth if he could commemorate himself 
in that way. Well, traveling up the Rhone Valley a little, but still with excellent maritime context. We've come out of the Mediterranean, as it were, through Marseille, and we're making our way up the Rhone. We reach the great ancient city of Vienne. Still, if you've ever been there, you'll find that the, the traffic makes its way around roundabouts, where the, which at the center are just loaded with discarded pieces of Roman masonry. And here, I can introduce you to a named singer of the fifth century cathedral, Mamertus Claudianus. I think by now, I hardly need to emphasize to you how grandly Roman and indeed aristocratic his name sounds. And in the very first lecture of this series, I emphasize to you, to those of you who are here, there is no way in which the story I have to tell you can be told in terms of the decline and fall of a Roman empire. It's much more to do with the continuing sense of being Roman, a material and cultural sense. Now, Mamertus Claudianus was the brother of the bishop. It's very often, as you can expect, that we find singers, um, the best singers anyway, related by blood to other powerful clerics. And he corresponded with a number of other Gallo-Roman gentlemen of the day, and we have their letters. One of them describes our man as everything a bishop could reasonably expect from one of his clergy and more besides. In addition to being a singer, he was a counselor in the bishop's court, a companion in his private reading, and his advisor on matters of scriptural interpretation. So it may be true that singers really didn't have much of an induction any more than a grave digger, but as we gradually unpeel the biography of this man, one can see that he is a person really of some consequence in his diocese. He was also, I quote, a singer of psalms and a choir director. Admired by his brother, he taught the trained companies to sing before the altar. This man reveals the kind of musician who is entirely absent from the count given by Boethius, with whom I began. Both Claudianus and Boethius were aristocrats and very near contemporaries, but what scope is there here? with this man, Mamertus Claudianus, brother of the bishop, singer, Episcopal confidant. What scope is there for Boethius' lofty disdain for the practical musician? Virtually none. I'd now like you to hear really a rather remarkable chant that Catherine is going to sing. This is the exultet, which was sung uh, before the candle during the Easter vigil. And what is very extraordinary about this chart is it is written down. That's how we know it. But in fact, it uses very few notes and keeps generating music for the text it, with very little material. It's the nearest thing I think I know to, a, as it were, a notated improvisation. But it is written down. It's wonderfully poised at the point where perhaps improvisation is passing into writing. May the heavenly host of angels exult. May the divine mysteries exult. And for the victory of so great a king, may the trumpet of salvation resound.
Well, now we go on the trail of another named singer, but this time we're going northwards to the great grasslands of northeastern France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. This is Frankish territory. We're a long way from the port of Marseille and the sea. In the first decades of the sixth century, a Frankish king who ruled in Reims, Cologne, and Trier decided to look southwards for a singer. In other words, he looked to what remained of the world Mamertus Claudianus had known in Vienne a generation earlier, with its trained companies of singers in southern Gaul, where churches might be adorned as the Church of Aix-en-Provence is, for example, with Roman columns that have been reused. Now, this Frankish king bore, of course, an appropriate Frankish name, Theoderic. Now, he and his line had come an immense distance in just 40 years. His father, I beg your pardon, his grandfather, Childeric, had been buried around 482 with 21 horses, perhaps the entire stock of the royal stable, all of them slain in what must have been a horrendous ceremony and placed in pits nearby. This was all uncovered in Tournai, just across the border from France into Belgium. Their massive and entangled skeletons, eventually discovered and photographed, provide an unnerving reminder of what it could mean being a pagan in northern Europe towards about 500. Childeric. He, he fought in the, Ro the Roman army, like many Germans. He did military service for, for the Romans, but he was a pagan, and he was buried, as I say, with a vast number of skeletons of his horses, well, with his horses, of which now only the skeletons remain. But two generations later, Theodoric, his grandson, was a Christian, and a kind of late Roman governor writ large. The greatest city of his kingdom was Trier, formerly, of course, an imperial capital, and Theodoric certainly saw himself as a kind of provincial Constantine. Now, the imperial basilica at Trier, which still stands, some of you may have seen it, it's a massive audience hall, is likely to have been the heart, I think, of Theodoric's royal manor, allowing him, as a barbarian king, to rule from a hall where emperors had once received reports from provincial governors and listened to the panegyrics of the poets. Now, Theodoric recognized the responsibilities a Christian king bore to the Roman religion. He decided to make sure that the cathedral would be staffed with able clergy, including gifted singers, in what ranks, I think, as the first royal act of its kind in the annals of the barbarian West. To accomplish this, he looked, as I said, to the regions of Gaul further south, specifically to Clermont in the black volcanic landscape of the Auvergne. As a chronicler says, he brought many clerics from Clermont whom he ordered to serve in the church at Trier. Now, the bishop of Clermont was so vigilant, there's a bishop again, of course, as the key person, was so vigilant on King Theodoric's behalf that he succeeded in recruiting a youth of excellent Gallo-Roman family called Gallus. This young man refused the marriage envisaged for him by his father and entered a monastery while he was still an adolescent. And he had a voice of wonderful sweetness with a great melodiousness. When the bishop heard him sing at the abbey, presumably during one of his visitations, he recognized at once that this boy should be taken and taught in the cathedral, not left in a rural monastery. In a word, the bishop simply stole him and took him out of the monastery, acted as his spiritual advisor, and when it became clear to all that Gallus's voice was becoming more and more perfect with each day, he was stolen again, this time by the king. In the event, the king and the queen enjoyed his singing so much they wouldn't let him go. The queen especially apparently loved him because of his beautiful voice, so they kept him. He was a talented singer, plucked against his will possibly from the monastic life by a bishop who was scouting, in effect, for musical talent for the king. Now, there's no reason to think any of this was exceptional, though it is exceptionally well documented. Capable singers in the great churches of the realm or in the traveling contingents that later became private chapels were a valued part of what the, turned the kings of the barbarian west from warlords, mere warlords, 
into magnates of recognizable kinds. As I said before, little Constantines, provincial versions of that great Christian emperor. For their political strength and their salvation, these kings needed liturgies on a lavish scale with gifted singers supported by lavish textiles, silk, linen, precious metals, and imported incense. Now think of that, imported incense. A very expensive commodity that has to come a very long way and you use it by destroying it and then have to get more. The history of what churches had incense in the early Middle Ages and how they got it is a remarkably fascinating chapter in the history of early medieval communications and globalization, how the world was actually working. What could you still buy at any particular time? Well, we've glanced at France and Italy. Very briefly, I'd like to glance at Africa. And here we set ourselves down, I think, in one of the most fascinating of all the barbarian polities, the realm of the Vandals. Here was a Germanic and household-based kingdom established in one of the richest parts of the old empire. Given the reputation the Vandals have acquired, and we all know what the word means in colloquial English, it's striking that an impressive sequence of Latin poets can be traced in Vandal Africa around 500. I live in Cambridge, by the way, and nearby, of course, is a town called Wandleberry, whose name will only etymologize as Vandal Town. So some of them clearly settled here. And scholars are still disputing whether the name Andalusia is derived from the passage of the Vandals through Spain. But perhaps sensual poetry, luxurious poetry, is what one should expect from poets writing in a wealthy port city like Carthage, whose hinterlands, of course, had fed the Roman Empire. One of the richest grain baskets of the Roman Empire was to be found in the hinterlands of Carthage. And these Romano-Vandal poets speak of mosaics, richly dressed tables and precious textiles. They praise the culture of a city that abounds in, in, in baths and public, other public resources and so on. Four lines of them, in fact, praise a singer. Wherefore, O priest, do you hasten away, driven by gluttony? Surely your mind is fixed on goblets rather than psalms. Seek not the benches of taverns, but the lecterns of churches, the food of heaven, not drinking vessels. That clearly is a singer. And more information comes from a chronicle compiled by Victor of Vita. Uh, and he was a Catholic. But remember that the Vandals were Christians, but they weren't Catholics. They were Arians. That is to say, they believed that there was a time when Christ was not, and that Christ was created, the Son was created by the Father for the purposes of redemption, something that all Catholics and all Anglican Protestants deny every day that they say, as it was in the beginning. So they were Arians. And they worshipped, actually, in Gothic, not in Latin, because Gothic was the language they'd been converted in. It makes a difference, really, singing, Pater noster qui es in seris, sanctificet ut nomen tuum, as opposed to, Ata un sar duda in himinam, weichenai namo thines, it's a very different sort of thing. There's got to be some reason to do an English degree, and being able to do the Lord's Prayer in Vandalic or Gothic has got to be the reason for doing it. <laughs> Now, Victor of Vita describes a service in a place called Regia, which is probably somewhere in modern Algeria. And there we have a singer who is standing and singing a psalm. Uh, the people are joining in, incidentally. This is a kind of transitional moment where we, you and I, have not yet been silenced. We're allowed to say Alleluia in return, but not very much more. And finally, we cross into Spain where the rich material provides an early illustration of what singers and their, and their art could mean to the politics, indeed, to the incipient nationhood of an early medieval kingdom. In the year 589, the Spanish church held a great council at Toledo. It marked the birth of Catholic Spain, in effect, because they had been, the kings had been Arians, like their Vandal neighbors, and they became Catholics. At another council in 633, the Spanish bishops ruled there was to be one order of praying and chanting throughout the kingdom. A comprehensive regulation for the ordinance of liturgical plain song was here issued on the, sc on the scale of an entire kingdom, from Seville and Granada in the south to Toulouse and Carcassonne in the north, which were part of the Visigothic kingdom, a, a region called Septimania. 
Almost immediately, the Spanish bishops and others set about the work of composing new chants. They really got down to it quickly. Bishop Leander of Seville composed many a sweet melody, according to his brother Isidore. Bishop John of Saragossa composed certain things for liturgical celebrations, both words and music, in an elegant manner. Bishop Carnancius of Valencia put forth many musical melodies in a distinguished fashion. And so it goes on. Bishop Braulio of Saragossa was illustrious for his songs and writing. That really is quite a gathering of Episcopal musicians. And the way these eminent men composed in a refined or elegant manner leaves no doubt that they had put together or put forth both words and music in a sufficiently stable form the results were to be memorized and praised in writing. To those that remembered their names, the chants these bishops composed remained the property of their makers. I'm on the verge of saying their composers. And now I'd like you to hear a chant from the old Spanish liturgy. Dies mei transierunt. My days are past, my purposes are broken off, even the thoughts of my heart. This is from Job, of course. I have said to corruption, thou art my father. To the worm, thou art my mother and my sister. Free me, Lord, put me next to thee. Much of the Spanish repertoire can't be transcribed. It's in a notation that we can't read. This chant, as you can probably tell since you're about to hear it, can be transcribed and recovered. An exceptional insight into the schooling of singers who sang chants like that comes from a Latin poem called Admonition to a Cantor, which survives among the material in a 10th century antiphona of Leon. The poem, I should think, is probably much older than that. These verses communicate a very clear sense of the singer as a responsible member of the ecclesiastical staff from whom much is expected. <clears throat> Cantors should avoid being carried away with what the poet calls vain human plaudits, poisonous human prayers drawing the soul into the terrible fires of hell. You can see that what that implies about the pleasure some singers, singers took in being praised and admired. But despite the appeal to the ear of God, just sing for the ear of God, there's a strong sense in the poem of a listening congregation, indeed of an audience. They're described as those standing by even as the listeners. The cantor should sing with a contrite heart, with a voice that accords with his inner disposition, for that's how he will inspire others to piety. As for the praise he's offered, he should think of it as a bag full of wind, without lapsing into indifference, however, so that he neglects his art. And the process of schooling singers in what's almost certainly a cathedral comes into view with the poet's requirement that the cantor, now envisaged as the leader of a group, or at least as a teacher, has an obligation to teach. He should scout around for those who can sing well. But these successes are not to become the basis for seeking higher office. Now, that's very interesting. 
suggesting that there were some singers who actually used their position as singers to go much, much higher in the ecclesiastical hierarchy. And above all, singers should be benign, peaceable, and modest. They must be without guile and of good reputation, always behaving with rectitude and measure. Who says the Middle Ages have nothing to teach us? Thank you. <laughs>